Welcome to Biographics. This video is made possible by the good people at Skillshare, helping people level up their skills since 2010. If you haven't joined yet, what have you been doing for the last nine years? Wasting your time being unskilled, that's what. Join Skillshare today through the link below and support our show and yourself by getting more mad skills. And let's get into it. Three centuries after the fall of the Roman Empire, most of Western Europe was divided into small kingdoms frequently at war with each other. They were threatened by the Umayyad Caliphate from the south, subject to the influence of the Byzantine Empire from the east, and prone to the interference of the papacy. Cultural and economic development languished, marred by a lack of strategic vision and the loss of centuries' worth of classical knowledge. Then, in the 8th century, a new ruler emerged, a king who would bring about a cultural, political, and military renaissance. He could be as ruthless with his enemies as he was enlightened in his administration of his kingdom. Today's protagonist was hailed as the father of modern Europe. He was celebrated in art, in literature, and even in heavy metal concept albums sung by Christopher Lee. His name was Charles the Great, better known as Charmaine. Much of Charmaine's life is documented by a biographer, Ironheart, who was his contemporary. And he also happened to be his maths teacher when the king was already an adult. However, Einhard himself admits that little is known about his early years. We do know that the boy Charles, later known as Charmaine, was probably born in Aachen, modern-day Germany, in 742. He was the eldest son of King Pepin of the Franks and had a brother called Carloman. Carloman means free man-man. King Pepin was the first of a new dynasty, the Carolingians, named after his own father, Charles Martel. Charles Martel was not a king, though he was a mayor of the palace to the kings of the Merovingian dynasty, which had ruled the region since the year 450. The Merovingians had been losing power and influence for years, becoming merely figureheads, while the real power was wielded by the mayor, a role sort of like today's prime minister. Pepin was bent on replacing the last of the Merovingians, Childeric III, as monarch and sole ruler. To do so, he needed legitimacy, and at that time the finest purveyor of legitimacy was the Pope. He addressed a letter to Pope Zachary in Rome, asking, Is it right that a powerless ruler should continue to bear the title of king? Zachary agreed immediately. He needed a powerful champion, as the church in Rome was under a double threat. Politically, the Lombard kingdom in Italy was increasingly hostile towards the Pope's secular rule. Ideologically, the Byzantine Empire wanted to impose a ban on representations of Christ in all Western European churches, as this was seen as idolatry. Pepin was crowned King of the Franks in 751 and named both of his sons as successors. He defeated the Lombards, donating a large portion of their land to Zachary. The Pope in return thanked Pepin by graciously and totally scamming him. Let me explain. Zachary produced a document known as the Donation of Constantine, drafted by the Roman Emperor himself, which stated that all Christian monarchs gave up their rule voluntarily to the papacy and that the Pope then handed it back. In other words, a king was such by the grace of the Pope, and the Pope had the ultimate authority over his right to reign. Pepin accepted this, but what he did not know, being poorly educated and illiterate, is that the document was a forgery, an instrument by which the papacy sought to control Christian kingdoms. While his father ascended to the throne and dealt with popes and Lombards, we can assume that Charles was busy training to become the warrior king that he would later become. We are only going to relate two specific episodes of his youth. In two occasions, at the age of six and then at the age of fifteen, he swore an oath of allegiance to the papacy and Christendom. Charles would use his sword to protect and expand Christianity, an oath that would shape many of his military decisions. In 768, Pepin died, and the Frankish kingdom was split among his two sons. At this time, the kingdom included most of modern-day France, Belgium, and some territories in western Germany. Charles and Carloman did not get along very well due to their radically different personalities. Charles always favored direct action, while his brother was less impulsive. The first major disagreement came when the province of Aquitaine in southwestern France rebelled in 769. Carloman was against military intervention, while Charles could not wait to march against the rebels, which he did, quickly defeating them and annexing a new province, Gascony, along the way. The following year, 770, Charles was 20 28, and he thought it was time to marry. His was a political choice, a Lombard princess, daughter of King Desiderius. The marriage was so unhappy and short-lived that we don't even know the name of the girl. Charles, in fact, repudiated her the same year to marry a Swabian teenager, Hildegard. Desiderius was furious. He approached Carloman, proposing an alliance to topple that playboy Charles, 
and a civil war was on the horizon. But very conveniently, Carloman died in 771, apparently of natural causes. The Frankish kingdom it was now united under Charles' rule. For most of the time of his 56-year reign, Charles was busy with military campaigns, crushing rebellion, securing borders, and expanding his dominions. According to historian C.W. Hollister, these campaigns initially were not born out of a clear vision. Charles led his armies on yearly campaigns as a matter of course. Only gradually did he develop a notion of Christian mission and a program of unifying and systematically expanding the Christian West. So we'll first take a look at his wars against the Saxons, which he waged from 772 to 804. Nowadays, Saxony corresponds to a vast area of northern Germany, bordering the Netherlands and Denmark. The Saxon people were split into several different tribes and had been on good terms with the Franks, which used their territory as a trade route with the Danes. Things changed in 772 when a Saxon party raided and burned a church in the Frankish town of Deventer. It is not known why, but this was the perfect excuse for Charles to invade. The Saxons still held pagan beliefs and worshipped the Norse pantheon of gods, something Charles did not tolerate. It has been speculated that the Deventer raid may have been a false flag attack orchestrated by the Franks. In retaliation, Charles led his army into Saxony and destroyed the sacred tree Minsul, the tree of life in Norse mythology. This was only the first of 18 invasions, all marked by much burning, pillaging, and slaughtering. In 777, the Saxon tribes united behind the warrior chief Widdenkins, a name which translates as Child of the Forest. His resistance was brave and hard fought, but he had little chance to succeed against the Frankish armies. Widdenkins did succeed in convincing King Secret of Denmark to allow Saxon refugees into his kingdom, though. Charles's campaigning grew increasingly ruthless, perpetrating actions that nowadays would have, have him trialed at the Hague International Court of Justice. In 782, he ordered the murder of 4,500. 500 Saxon prisoners. This was the massacre of Verdun, an atrocity condemned even by his contemporaries. The Saxons continued fighting, preserving their autonomy and their religion. But Wittenkind realized that this could not go on forever, and he allowed himself to be baptized in 785 as a gesture of peace. The rebel leader disappeared from historical records after this event, but his followers they still did not yield. Charles continued with his campaigns, even preventing refugees from escaping to Denmark in 798. After 32 years of war, Charles had finally found a solution in 804. He ordered the mass deportation of 10,000 Saxons to Neustria, northwestern France, while locating a similar number of Franks into Saxony. This forced displacement effectively ended the conflict and absorbed Saxony into Charles' dominions. Now Charles' territories they bordered with Denmark, and this did not please the Scandinavian kings. Siegfried of Denmark attacked Frisia, today's Netherlands, almost immediately. Fortunately for the Frisians, the Dane died shortly afterwards, and his successor sued for peace. While waging a protracted conflict against the Saxons, Charles was able to conduct campaigns in other parts of Europe. In 774, answering a plea from the Pope, he crossed the Alps and defeated the Lombards after besieging their capital, Pavia. The Lombard kingdom was annexed by Charles, who now became King of the Franks and the Lombards. He then turned his attention to the Basques, who were threatening Gascony. The Basques were, and are, a tough bunch, and defeated Charles at the Battle of Roncevaux Pass in 778. But ultimately, they were beaten, as were the Saracens in northern Spain. The Franks and the Saracens, or Moors, continued fighting intermittently until 812. Charles was able to seize from the Moors Corsica, Sardinia, and the Balearic Islands. In northern Spain, the Saracens were put in check by the foundation of the Spanish March, a fortified buffer zone extending from the Pyrenees to the Ebro River and Barcelona. During the 780s, Charles scored further victories in Germania and Italy. He expanded his kingdom southwards in 787 by conquering part of southern Italy after the siege of Salerno. He also stretched eastward by annexing Bavaria and Carinthia, modern-day Austria, in 788. In 795, Charles attacked the powerful empire of the Eibars of Hungary. He had had his sights set on them since the conquest of Lombardy, but had interrupted the campaign to deal with the Saxons. In the meantime, a civil war had weakened the Eibars. Charles took advantage, and by 796, he had conquered their fortified capital, known as the Ring, looting their enormous treasure. After a revolt in 799, the Avar were definitively crushed in 803. Further expansion continued into Eastern Europe. The northern Balkans and the lands up the rivers of Oder and the Danube all became dependent territories of the mighty Charlemagne. 
Now, you might not be mighty right now, but that's only because you haven't become extremely skilled through the use of Skillshare, today's sponsor. Skillshare of 30,000 courses covering everything from basic battlefield tactics to how to manage a raiding party and even the skills needed for effective pillaging. Not really. Obviously. But really, Skillshare has legit stuff. I mean, I'm sure we'd all love to go out raiding, but hey, we probably should be focusing on practical skills like productivity, programming, and presentation skills. And guys, that's just the P's. I could go on. Those are the things we need in life, and many more things which are all available to learn on Skillshare. And it's all super affordable. Look, I'm the sort of person who will go to the all-you-can-eat sushi place and absolutely gorge myself on sushi. And that's why I like Skillshare, stick with me here. Unlike other platforms, Skillshare is just one affordable monthly fee and you can take all the courses you want. It's like all you can eat sushi, except for knowledge and skills. You don't have to pay for individual courses at all. And guess what guys, we've got an ultra, ultra exclusive deal, two months free. You've never heard that anywhere else before. But seriously though, if you do sign up through our link below, you do get two months for free. And it would make a big difference if you use my link because then it supports this show. I would love you for that. And let's get back to Charlie. All the kingdoms and populations seemed to succumb incredibly easy to Charles's armies, except for the Saxons. So how did Charles achieve this? What were his winning strategies? The Frankish army it was organized around a corps of heavy cavalry, an aristocratic warrior elite wearing chain mail and rounded helmets armed with swords and lances. They were supported by infantry carrying pole arms and shields, fighting in massed ranks. Disappointingly for Hollywood, Charlemagne's armies avoided large pitched battles, if possible. Surprisingly, when they were lured into battle, they performed poorly. The Frankish established their superiority through well-prepared long-term campaigns instead, which harassed and wore down their opponents over time. In fact, the value of Charles's cavalry did not lay in spectacular charges against enemy fortifications. Rather, Charles exploited its speed of deployment, the ability to harass enemies, burn villages, loot and pillage, before quickly moving on to another theater. Charles was also a master of logistics. He usually planned his campaigns around Easter, the period in which plenty of fodder was available for the horses, making the most of the army's greatest asset. His vassals were ordered to gather at least three months' worth of food prior to a campaign to ensure sustainability. Unlike the custom of the time, the Frankish army did not simply raid enemy territories and then leave as a means to enrich themselves. Charles made sure that new fortresses were built and garrisoned in the areas he invaded. Another asset at Charles's disposal was the sheer size of his army, numbering up to 35,000 men. While relatively small numbers for late classical period standards, this was a juggernaut compared to the enemies of the Franks. This allowed Charles to split up his army into two or more corps and to perform pincer movements to outmaneuver their defenses. In short, Charlemagne's dominance in logistics and strategy meant that he could afford to avoid the battlefield, but if he did engage in battle and lost, well, he could still win the war. What really made possible this military organization was the administrative reforms which Charles implemented during his reign. In order to administer such a large territory, Charles divided his kingdom into an inner core and an outer regna. The core comprised the provinces of Austrasia, Neustria, and Burgundy, supervised directly by him in a system of envoys. The outer regna was divided into counties, each ruled by a trusted count or earl. In turn, they presided over a number of lesser vassals, each of whom was expected to train and equip himself for cavalry warfare. The counts could also rely on seven scabini each. These were experts in law, which ensured unity in the administration administration of justice. Border counties were grouped into marches, and they were ruled by marquises. They had the responsibility to maintain borderline fortifications and raise rapid reaction forces in case of an invasion. Larger territories, characterized by a distinctive ethnic group, were organized as duchies. Charles also created two sub-kingdoms in Aquitaine and Italy, ruled by his sons Louis and Pepin, respectively. All the local rulers were summoned to attend an annual assembly, the March Field, in which they discussed political, judicial, military and religious matters. Charles's success as a ruler can be traced to his admiration for learning and education. His reign ushered in the Carolingian Renaissance, characterized by a rebirth of scholarship, literature, art, and architecture. 
Charlemagne's conquests they brought him into contact with the cultures of Moorish Spain, Anglo-Saxon England, and Lombard Italy, which greatly increased the institution of monastic schools and book copying centers. Charlemagne took a serious interest in scholarship, promoting the liberal arts at the court, ordering that his children and grandchildren be well educated, and even studying himself. He studied grammar, rhetoric, logic, astronomy, and arithmetic. Surprisingly, he was not able to write, and even his ability to read has been put into question by historians. What is not in question, though, was the fact that Charles had created the single largest political entity in Western Europe since the fall of the Roman Empire in 476. His kingdom had unified wildly different territories and ethnicities. They had been unified by force, but they were kept together by his administrative skills, which included the creation of a single currency and even a single writing system, the Carolingian Minuscule, which established unified rules for language, script, and grammar to ensure effective communication among every corner of the kingdom. And this kingdom, well, it was about to formally become an empire. In the year 800, Pope Leo III fell victim to a conspiracy led by Roman nobles. Accused of immorality and abuse of his office, he was forced to flee. Leo approached Charles, asking for help to regain the seat of Peter. Charles consulted with his advisor, who recommended that he accepted the Pope's plea for help. In December of the same year, Charles traveled to Rome to preside over Leo's trial. Under his forceful influence, Leo's name was cleared on the 23rd of that month. On Christmas Day, the pious Charles went to pray in front of St. Peter's tomb. When he emerged from the crypt, he was the target of a weird ambush. Ambush. Leo III just stepped in front of him and placed over Charles's head the imperial crown. This was a crown that had been headless in the West for centuries. With that simple gesture, Charlemagne had become the Holy Roman Emperor. In practical terms, this did not change anything with respect to his territorial dominions. Allegedly, Charlemagne, having been given the choice, would have refused the crown, but still, he did accept the added prestige. As a clever man, he had understood that the coronation was a ruse concocted by Leo to regain some authority after his double humiliation, first being ousted by the Romans, then begging Charles for help. Leo was basically saying, I'm still enough of a pope to make this man an emperor. But Charles was no fool, and he knew very well that the next step would be for Leo to pull out of the donation of Constantine. If you remember, this was the forgery that had fooled his dad Pepin. Charmaine did not fool for it, and never accepted the papacy's political interference over his rule. When dealing with the life of such a huge public figure, it's easy to forget the private man behind the scepter. Thankfully, Charmaine's biographer Einhard left an account of his private life. Charles was a tall and powerful man standing at six foot three, although he had a short neck and a pot belly. He regularly ate five meals a day, mainly consisting of grilled or roast meat. Apparently, he disliked doctors after they recommended that he switched to a lighter diet of stews. Now, I already mentioned the first two wives, the unnamed Lombard princess and Hildegard. This way, lady was always by his side even during his campaigns and bore him four sons and five daughters before dying at the age of only 26. So let's do some maths here. Although very testing, a healthy woman could give birth to a child every 12 months. Hildegard had nine children. Assuming that she was constantly pregnant, they married when she was 15. If, however, she did have some respite between pregnancies, well, that would place her first pregnancy at an even younger age. But you know, different times, different habits. Hildegard was buried in the Metz Cathedral, and her life became almost immediate fodder for legends in which she was Rikus and Blanche Fleur, or White Flower. Shortly after Hildegard's death, Charles married Fastrada, the daughter of an Austrasian count. According to Einhardt, she was beautiful, ambitious, and cruel. Fastrada died in 794, and Charmaine married a fourth time with Lutgard. Einhardt described her as ailing, good, and devout. Lutgard barely managed to be empress as she died in the year 800. After her, Charles did not marry again, but he did have four mistresses with whom he sired five more children. Unlike many monarchs before and after him, Charles had a very close bond with his children, spending plenty of time with them and taking a personal interest in their education. He made sure they studied to a proficient level the subjects of grammar, rhetoric, dialectics, geometry, astronomy, and music. After reaching the appropriate age, the sons were taught the real manly stuff expected of medieval princes – hunting, horse riding, and weapons training. But how about the daughters? Well, they were taught wool spinning. Nothing wrong with this, if it's your calling, but maybe they'd rather be off with their brothers horse riding in the woods and chasing wild animals. Charles never allowed his daughters to marry, and this was probably for political reasons. He already had to split his territories among four sons, and he could not afford to do the same for his potential sons-in-law.
In the later years of his life, from 801 to 810, Charles faced arguably his most powerful foe, the Byzantine Empire. Charlemagne and Emperor Nicephorus I waged war on land and sea for control of Venetia and the Dalmatian coast. The war progressed well for the Franks. Further, in 809, Nicephorus was distracted by a new war with the Bulgars. The Byzantines began negotiations with the Franks, and peace was agreed upon, in which Charlemagne gave up most of the Dalmatian coast in exchange for the Byzantine Emperor, recognizing him as Emperor of the West. In 813, Charlemagne appointed his son Louis the Pious as successor to the Holy Roman Emperor. Charlemagne died in 814 at the age of 72 of natural causes. Unfortunately, his death marked the beginning of the end for the empire and the ruling system that he had created. As pointed out by historian Professor Cantor, this was one of the cases in which a single death of a single person caused society around the world to revert to a less developed state. Charlemagne had created a solid infrastructure to ensure, at least in theory, the survival of the empire. But he had sowed the seeds of the decline with his conduct in the Saxon Wars. In addition to perpetrating a series of atrocities, Charles's conduct had enraged the Scandinavian kings and eliminated the Saxony buffer zone. The Danes waited for Charles's death and then unleashed their Viking raids on France, which Louis the Pious was unable to effectively fight back. The deterioration was further accelerated by the fact that the empire was later split amongst Louis's three sons, who had little interest in cooperating and preserving Charles's reforms. These three and their descendants were also under the influence and interference of the papacy. Unlike Charles, they had bought into the fraud that was the donation of Constantine. All in all, Charles's material legacy it did not last for more than two generations. However, he sowed the idea of the possibility of restoring a strong, unified empire in Western Europe. He is also credited for being the initiator of the concept of a united Europe. Moreover, the kingdoms he created were the basis for current nation-states, and his cultural reforms slowly dragged European people out of the Dark Ages. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below, and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this four times per week, so subscribe to this channel so you can find out about those. And as always, thank you for watching.